Father, I just thank you that you are here with us this morning. For some people who are joining us this morning, they, uh, there is a storm raging around them and the waves are high. Father, I pray that you would pour out your spirit on them this morning. Would you surround them with your presence? And as I talk this morning, Father, a bit more about going deeper with you in these hard places, would you just take my words and deliver them with gentleness and kindness? Will I just lift this up, this, these words I'm about to say, put them in your hands. Will you take them and use them? Amen. So good morning, uh, my name's Suzanne, and it's really great to be with you this morning as we continue our sermon series of Going Deeper. Now hopefully you know by now that um, each week a member of our leadership team is coming to share with you their personal response to this theme. And so this morning I've chosen to talk about going deeper with God in the hard places. And this kind of came from a conversation that I had with a young person quite recently. They told me that they had grown up in the church, that they believed there was a God and that he is the creator of everything. But they were really struggling with this making sense of this God of love that they heard about in church every week and the crippling anxiety and depression that they had spent most of their life battling. They couldn't understand why a loving God would continue to let them suffer and struggle day in, day out, year in, year out. And this person said that they had stopped going to church because they felt like they just didn't fit in. That you couldn't ask these kinds of questions and have these kinds of doubts in church. And it got me thinking about those really hard places in life where we wrestle with what we know about God and the reality of the situation that we're facing. We have this encouragement, don't we, in Psalm 9, verses 9 to 10. Mike read it to us this morning. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Now, on the face of it, that is a really comforting passage. It tells us that in times of trouble, we can turn to our Father God, that he will be a safe place for us. But what does that look like in real life? What's the reality of finding refuge in God when we're in those really hard places. I've picked out three key points that I want to draw from this passage this morning to really explore this. First of all, knowing who God is. Secondly, trusting in God. And third, celebrating God. So let's start off with knowing who God is. You know, each of our places are going to look different. It might be that you're struggling with long-term illness, bereavement of a lost one, the stress and worry of crippling debt. Maybe you're helplessly watching someone succumbing to addiction. Maybe you're struggling with the grief and sorrow of infertility, the desire to self-harm. The list can go on and on and on. These are the realities of our hard places. And each of us will respond differently to those hard places, but we'll probably have some common responses that each of us go through. Why is this happening to me? Help me, God. Why won't you take this away from me? These kinds of cries aren't new. We see it in the Bible, in the book of Psalms, particularly with David. In Psalm 22, he cries out to God, this guttural cry, God, my God, why would you abandon me now? Why do you remain distant? 
refusing to answer my tearful cries in the day and my desperate cries for your help in the night. I can't stop sobbing. Where are you, my God? David shows us that it's okay to cry out to God with these questions and these emotions. And I can totally relate to David in this as he talks of desperate cries for help in the night, in those dark places when you feel so alone and isolated in your anguish. He cries out again in Psalm 13, O Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? I don't believe, however, that these cries of David are cries of accusation or of doubt. They are cries of a person who knows who God is. They are cries of faith. He is reaching out to God because he knows that God has promised to be his refuge and his stronghold. He has faith in that promise, but in that storm. Our passage this morning says that the ones who find refuge in God are the ones who know his name. Why do we need to know God's name? When the Bible names are important, they tell you something about a person. They give you a picture of who that person was. And we see it all through the Bible. The various names of God, like Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. When Jesus changes Simon's name to Cephas or Peter, the rock. When God changes Abraham's name to Abraham, meaning multitude, to reaffirm his promise. So this this line is saying that those who know God, who know his name, who know what he's about, will find refuge. I was reading an article this week about the um, sportsman, the long jumper, Jonathan Edwards, who became known for refusing to um, compete on a Sunday early on in his career because of his Christian faith. But years later, he renounced his faith. And as he reflected on it in this article, he said, I had taken things for granted that were taught me as a child without subjecting them to any kind of analysis. So he had grown up in church, his dad was a vicar, and found a faith in what he was taught there. But he had never really questioned or explored the foundations of that faith for himself. And so when these things that had been taught him about about God were challenged in his life, he lacked the resilience and a strong foundation of faith on which to stand. So in order for us to establish our own uh, resilience and personal belief in who God is, it's so important that we wrestle and we probe the questions that we hold inside. We need to find ways of creating safe spaces that allow people to explore their doubts and their uncertainties without judgment. A friend of mine shared with me their own experience of why this is so important. They said to me, when my son was born, he was very poorly, and I struggled with the idea that God would let something happen to an innocent newborn baby who had done nothing wrong. I was raging and had no idea if it was okay to be angry and certainly wouldn't have admitted it to anyone. If we can make church a safe place to wrestle with issues and uncertainties it allows us that space to be honest without fear of recrimination or of guilt of our own guilt for feeling these emotions i wonder how can we holy trinity create a healthy atmosphere within our church that allows and encourages people to explore these sorts of feelings I wonder if any of you will relate to this person's experience. They said, 
I grew up in an evangelical church. When I was in my early 20s, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. People prayed for healing, and I believed the promises I had heard that these prayers would be answered. He died at the age of 55 when I was 25. I just didn't understand. I didn't stop believing in God, but I couldn't understand how or why this had happened. I couldn't go to church or listen to Christian teaching or mix with other Christians because what I heard there didn't match with my own experience. Somehow, we need to create a culture that gives people permission to wrestle with those difficult questions. By doing so, we're giving space to pe for people to make some sense of what they're experiencing, whilst preparing others for difficult times that they will inevitably face in life. What might that look like for Holy Trinity in 2021 when we're in a time of uh, all kinds of stuff going on, hard times with this pandemic? What can we do as a church community to create space? I don't know what the answer is of that. It's something for us all to discuss and to, to you know, share ideas. I'd love you to share some ideas with us. One of the places that I have found to be a really great place to share my um, uncertainties, my questions, my experiences, is in small, a small group. In preparation for today, my own home group had numerous sessions where we just brought to, to the session our own experiences, our own questions and uncertainties, the things that we struggle with. We wrestled with them together. We knew we weren't going to find quick, easy answers, but just the act of discussing and the act of sharing helped. If you're not in a small group, I really encourage you to look into joining one. It's a really great safe space to share your questions and explore your uncertainties. But we can't just do that in small groups. We have to do that as a church family. Now, some people might worry that the very act of expressing doubts about God and in considering questions like, why does God allow suffering? Why do some children die so young? Why does God heal one person and not the other, another? They think maybe that will weaken our faith. We'll put our faith on shaky ground as we ask those questions. But I believe this process of probing and discussing and questioning is the exact opposite. We're actually pursuing God. We're seeking to know more of him. And it means that we have to delve more into his word and read this book and search for truth. And as we read more and more of this book, as we learn more and more about God and we get a sense and a knowledge of who he is, that's what lays our foundations. Let's re return to verse 10 of today's passage. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. I want to unpack that trust bit in a moment, but first, just think about that second line. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Just think about all those examples in this book of people, people like you and me, who have reached out into God in desperate times, and he has not forsaken them. Abraham, Moses, Daniel, Esther, Paul and Silas, there are so many. We have this rich history at our fingertips of God's faithfulness to his people. And we can read about that and we can draw on it and we can talk about it. So rather than those questions and uncertainties weakening our faith and shaking our foundations, this freedom to wrestle and explore actually leads us to a stronger foundation that we can hold on to 
when we hit those really hard places in our lives. So as we spend more time seeking and searching and wrestling with these things, the more we soak in his word, the more we will see Christ. Our foundations will be strengthened so when we hit those hard places, we can cry out to God and seek his refuge while standing on that solid rock of his word and his promises and his history of never forsaking the people that cry out to him. So this is all theory at this point. What might that look like in real life? I was watching a funeral online last week and when you lose somebody who is precious, there are inevitable emotions of grief and anger that can be so overwhelming. And the person speaking at the funeral said something that really stood out. He said, get angry at God, shout at Jesus and stamp your feet, is that is what you want to do. But don't shut him out. Let him in to comfort, because that is is what Jesus does. It's what we see David doing in the Psalms. He's stamping his foot, he's getting angry at God, he's crying out, but at the same time, he is asking God to come and to be in it with him. Let's move on to my point number two, trusting in God. Those who know your name trust in you. Rob Bell wrote in his book, Velvet Elvis, the moment that God is figured out with nice neat lines and definitions, we are no longer dealing with God. We are dealing with someone made up. In passage after passage, we find God reminding people he is beyond and bigger and more. I've talked a lot about getting to know who God is, but we also need to come to terms with the fact that God is mysterious and he is way beyond our complete understanding. Isaiah 55 verse 8 says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, said the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. And this is where faith comes into play. Trust in God is about reaching a point where we are able to hold the knowledge that God is good, but holding that intention with the pain and suffering that we are experiencing ourselves at that time. It's about having faith in what we know rather than what we can see. If we return to Psalm 13, after David has cried out to God about the anguish in his soul, he goes on to say, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. At this point, nothing has changed. He is still in his hard place, but as he cries out with honesty to God about his struggle, he is also proclaiming into that who God is. Now we have the knowledge that God has shown the depth and the breadth of his love in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and we can claim that truth over our own hard places. But what does putting our trust in God actually look like in, heart, in real true life? It's going to look different for different people. So I'm going to share with you this morning my own experience. And it's not going to be easy to share with you, but this is my example. It's going to look different for you. Back in 2017, I went through a really hard place. It was a time when a loved one was suffering with anxiety and depression. And there were nights when I would go to bed, not knowing if that person would still be alive when I woke up in the morning. And I cried out to God to take this away, 
to take this person out of their darkness. And there were times when I had no words other than to say, Jesus, help me, will you come? And I was gripped by fear and terror that I would lose this person, that somehow my actions or words that I said would have an influence over whether this person would live or die. And this went on for quite a long time. And in the summer of 2018, I went to Naturally Supernatural, the summer conference run by Soul Survivor, and I was still struggling, desperate to see breakthrough for my loved one. Now, some of you know, sung worship is really important to me. It's a really important way for me to speak to God, a way of expressing my feelings. I often struggle for the right words to say in spoken prayer. I struggle to express how I'm feeling and what I want to say. And I find it much easier to sing my prayer and express what I'm feeling inside through music. And I spent that conference singing every worship song, every single word for my loved one, every ounce of my being, singing out in prayer and crying out those words to God. And in the middle of the week, we sang a song about Jesus overcoming death. And as I sang the words, it is beaten, death has lost its sting, the thought came into my mind. And this is what I wrote in my notebook at the time. I need to let go, of, let go or release of my fear of my loved one dying, to hand him over to God. That if he did die, it would be okay, all his pain would be gone, but I had to put him into God's hands. So basically, God was saying to me in that moment, I felt him saying, I want you to trust me with this person. Trust me that I've got them. And whether that means they stay in this life or not, you've got to let go and trust that they are safe in my hands. And as I felt God saying that, it broke me. I fell to my knees sobbing. I didn't want to let that person go. I didn't want them to die. I wanted to hope that if I released that fear, then the worst wouldn't happen. But somehow I knew it didn't work like that, that trust doesn't work like that. To truly trust in God, I had to truly hand him over. God had given me that choice to accept that this person I loved would be safe in his hands, to trust in God's plans and good purposes, whatever the outcome or even if that meant not seeing or being with that person again in this life, or I could remain gripped by that pain and fear that was consuming me, and it was so hard. Sometimes trusting in God is really hard. And throughout the rest of that week, as I worshipped and I cried out to God, he helped me to reach that place where I was able to let go and put my loved one in his hands. And I could only do that by trusting who I knew God to be in knowing that he is a good, good father and God who loved the world so much that he came to live amongst us and get right in the middle of our mess with us. And I had prayed so many times for my loved one to be healed, but at that moment in time, God's answer to my prayer was actually for him to carry my burden. Excuse me. I don't understand why the prayer to answer wasn't to heal. That remains beyond my comprehension. But what I do know is I, no longer, I was no longer consumed by that overwhelming fear or by the tension that I'd been holding in my body. Putting your trust in God in your hard place will look completely different to mine. It will be something entirely different maybe that you need to hand over to God. I don't know what that is. I'm not even going to make any examples or suggestions, but take a moment right now just to think and decide for yourself what it would mean for you 
to place your trust in God right now. I'm coming to land on celebrating God. It is possible to celebrate and praise God during, during these times of trouble. David moves from, oh Lord, how long will you forget me forever? To, I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me in the space of six verses. It took me a little longer. Exactly a year after that summer conference, I returned to Naturally Supernatural. The tension and the fear that had gripped me had gone, but the 12 months in between were by no means easy. There'd been no sudden transformation, no healing. My loved one was still struggling with the same issues. But it wasn't until a year later when I was back at NSN that I realised quite how much had changed. As I said before, music is an important part of my conversation with God. And one day the band began playing a song called Do It Again by Elevation Worship. I didn't know the song, at least I don't remember ever hearing it before. But as they played the first few bars, the refrain at the beginning of the song, it called out to me. It's really hard to describe, but it was like the volume was turned up. It, It just completely captured my attention Um, and as we started singing I knew that the Holy Spirit was speaking to me through that song and as I sang the words it was kind of like scales had dropped from my eyes and God showed me how far we had come together in that past year. Some of the words that really still stick with me from that song I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. And as I sang those words, it became this this prayer of joy and celebration. And those words still remind me today of that experience and of that confidence that I can have in God, that nothing is too great for him that he can, whatever you are facing, even if it feels it will never end, God is there, he can always make a way. You know, that year before, I thought there was no way out. I couldn't see how we were going to get through what was happening. But he makes a way. Again, your praise and your celebration will look different to mine. Not everyone relates Uh, through singing and music like I do. And so I encourage you to find your own way that connects you with God in those hard places but allows you to celebrate with joy and to praise him for who he is. Acknowledge the greatness of God in your own special way. Now, none of this is easy, not for anyone, I don't know if you saw an interview this week on BBC Breakfast with Archbishop Justin Welby. When he was asked about what words he can offer to those currently struggling and suffering in this pandemic, he referred to the time when his own child died as a result of a car crash. He said, anyone that gives a quick answer doesn't know what they're talking about. What I do remember is the presence of God in grief. It wasn't easy. It was awful. But there was a profound sense that when we called out to God, something, some things happened. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. May we cry out to God in anger, but when we're there, it's there that we find his love. I know that 
some of what I've shared this morning has been pretty hard. It's been hard to tell. Maybe it's been hard to listen to. Maybe it has triggered um, some of your own hard places and your own emotions. We're just going to have a time of uh, prayer and song. We're going to have that song, Do It Again. Um, and if you're somebody who does pray through music and singing, then I encourage you to sing out these words, these amazing words that God moves mountains and he makes a way. And if you're not somebody who connects with singing, then just take these words and pray them through. I wonder in this time of prayer and singing, if you sense any words of encouragement, whether you would just put them in the chat for those people who are in a hard place right now. If you're in a hard place right now and you feel able, maybe you wanna just put one word in the chat that lets us know and that we can cry out with you. Your church family can stand beside you in that. So let's just use this song as time to cry out to God, to pray, to whatever, and see what he has to say to us.